Okay, right, so my name is Roland Bock. I'm a principal software engineer at PPRO Financial Limited. I'm also the author of SQL++11. And today um, I want to talk to you about template magic for beginners. And what do, you mean, uh, what do we mean when we talk about template magic? Um, there are a number of things, like th there is these libraries that do crazy things, like the library from Klaus, the Blaze library that helps you with um, optimizing mathematical expressions. Right? So it teaches the, the compiler to do that. Um, there is my library, SQL++11. It teaches the compiler to understand SQL. And if you code SQL, then with this library in C++, the compiler will tell you if you make mistakes in SQL. It can tell you if you have uh, syntax errors. It can detect a bunch of semantic errors, right? Um, or if you can think of uh, Boost Proto. Don't know if you if you know that one. It's a library that is designed to help you write embedded domain-specific languages. So uh, with just a few strokes on the keyboard, you can create your own um, language in C++, just like that. Um, it takes a lot of keystrokes to actually make it do something useful, but just with a few keystrokes, suddenly you can write all kinds of expressions. doesn't do anything, but there you go. Um, and if you take it a little bit wi uh, longer, then you can get something like, um, like Boost Spirit. Boost Spirit even sounds like magic. And uh, you can use it to teach the compiler pretty much to parse any language. You just give it a BNF plus this library, and then you have a parser generated by the compiler for you. That is almost magical, right? And if you look at the code of these libraries, um, and you're not an expert for that, it looks like total gibberish. So it must be magic, right? And if you do something wrong, if you, if you make one false keystroke, then you're rewarded with whatever, uh, what you normally would get as a pupil for magic. You get a big explosion on your, on your screen as filled with all kinds of noise, right? Uh, all kinds of stuff that appears on, on, on the output of your compiler. It's totally unreadable. Right? It doesn't make any sense at all. And then you give this stuff to one of these template wizards, and they look at it and say, you know what? I think you're missing two pairs of curly braces here after the foo in line 17. You what? I have no idea what you're talking about. Try it. Right? Then you try it, you edit, error messages go away, maybe hundreds of warnings remain, who knows? Still looks terrifying, but the compiler does what it is intended to do and uh, generates a piece of code for you. Okay. Um, again, feels like magic if you look at the output, if you look at the library, whoa, uh, gibberish. But the reality is it's not magic. In reality, it's, it's the result of uh, something called template metaprogramming and hard work. And so I have a confession to make. This is really not an introduction to template magic. Um, welcome to template metaprogramming for beginners. So. Sorry if that disappoints you. Um, so in this talk, we'll, uh, we'll look at template metaprogramming uh, and some, some basic for that. Um, and we'll start with something that hopefully everybody in this room knows. And it's, we'll start actually with um, an interview question that I typically ask in a phone interview uh, for everybody who does a phone interview at our company. Um, and that is, what happens during pushback inside of a vector? Anybody wants to, to shout something? With or without moving. What? With or without moving. <laughs> I don't know, just give it a start.
Right. Okay. Okay. That that was awesome. And uh, so yes, um, so did he, pass? he he passed. I mean, he's he already has the job. <laughs> uh, but we didn't talk about this before. <laughs> I think I don't think you had a phone interview. But anyway, okay, okay, my fault. Um, yes. So. Um, Exactly. So one of the things that that's happening during happening during pushback is um, probably a call to reserve. So if the capacity is not enough, then there is going to be a call to reserve. And um, so now I'm just repeating what Michael said. Um, in reserve, there's a check. If the capacity is uh, is big enough, then well we don't have to do anything. But if the capacity is not enough, then we'll have to do something. Okay. And the something very much depends on. Uh, on what is stored in the vector. So if the value type of vector is bool, okay, then we'll have to do something. Mm -hmm. And actually, I don't really care about what it is. Um, if it's trivially copyable, then, and I'm not sure if, that the, if the standard really um, um, demands that, but most implementations uh, do um, a memory copy or a memory move in that case. If the elements are no except movable, then we'll move every single element to the new memory and otherwise we'll copy. Okay? Now, this is, these decisions or some of these decisions cannot be made at runtime. Okay. Um, does, any, does everybody know why this cannot be done at runtime, and not, at least not completely or in all cases? Anyone who wants to, to venture a guess? Some of the branches wouldn't compile, exactly. So for instance, um, let's take a, a vector of threads. Threat is, uh, is not copyable, it's just movable. So um, if we have a branch that copies everything um, and that has to compile so that we can make a decision at runtime, it just won't compile. Okay? So, um, yes. so we have to do some of these things at compile time. Some of these decisions have to be made at compile time, and then we only have to compile some of these branches. Okay. Good. So, in in order to to make this a little bit more uh, tangible and and easier for uh, for the mind, we'll first break it down into um, a smaller problem. So, instead of having four different branches, we just make two branches. Right? And the first decision is: well, if it's bool, then we'll do something. If it's not bool, then we'll do something else. Okay. And um, this is um, done with a uh, technique, at least in all implementations that I have seen, uh, with partial specialization. Partial specialization is a technique for um, template programming where you can um, constrain one or more template parameters to, to some, some rules um, and then give a different implementation for that. So the vector template uh, in, its, um, in its basis is with two parameters, um, t and, and the allocator, so value type and allocator. And we can say with partial specialization that we want to um, constrain the, the type t, for instance. Right? And the, the syntax for that and there is no, no good explanation for why this is, but uh, the syntax for that is, well, we will leave the, the part that is unconstrained as it is, in this case, the allocator still is unconstrained, and we say, okay, but the, the value type in this case, what we want to specify is bool, okay? So the, the lower part here is that we have a vector that is constrained to the value type bool and still some, some uh, arbitrary allocator. 
And for this, we can just give a different implementation. And in this different implementation, we can uh, deal with all the craziness that comes with vector of bool. Okay, so that you don't have these, don't have real references, but some proxy objects, and um, and reserve works differently and everything. So, um, all of this craziness can be put into into this one thing, um, partial specialization for vector, <coughs> and then we're done with it. Okay. And with bool out of the way, that leaves us with now three branches. Okay, so if it's trivially copyable, then we still do mem copy. If it's move, no except movable, um, then we move every single item to the new memory, um, and otherwise we copy. Uh, we can now say, okay, we'll, we'll take out some of the parts that have to be done all the time. Like for instance, uh, we always have to allocate new memory. Right, so we'll we'll move that out, and then well, we still have those three branches, and well, what worked before, we'll try that again. We'll make this a, a boolean problem again. Say okay, if it's trivially copyable, then we'll do mem copy, and otherwise we do cap copy or move. Okay. Now um, the question is, how do we how we, do we make this decision? Well, we, we have to make this decision at compile time, as we said. Um, how do we figure out if something is trivially copyable at compile time and even act on that? And the, the standard library has a bunch of tools for that that help us with this. And they are called type traits. Now, um, with type traits, we'll, we'll start with something very simple, or that looks very simple, but it's a powerful tool. Um, it's called an integral constant. It's a template. This template has a value type and a value of this value type. And can also, it also contains a, um, a const expert value of this type and, and the value. So internally, it represents basically the, the template arguments that you gave it. And um, with integral constant, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff, but um, the, the most common usage is that uh, is those two types that are displayed now, and that's true type and false type. These types are um, specializations of the integral constant. Okay, so integral constant um, bound to bool and uh, to, to true for, for the true type and to false for the false type. And the very important part about uh, templates and different parameters is that as soon as you have at least one parameter that's different to uh, in specialization with some other parameters, um, it's totally different types. Right? They look very much the same, so still stood integral constant and then two parameters but they are totally different. They are incompatible. You cannot assign one to the other. Um, it's two different types. For the compiler, that's like apples and oranges. Okay. So <clears throat> what we have here now is um, therefore two types. One is called true type, one is called uh, false type um, that also happen to, to present true and false. Okay, so that is nice. Um, We'll see how useful this actually is. There are also a bunch of traits. What, that's where the, um, where the name type traits comes from. And one is there that is actually extremely useful for what we just want to have. We want to decide if something is trivially copyable. And cool, the standard library thought of that. And uh, there are a bunch of others. But one of them is actually a test whether something is trivially copyable. And the struct is called is trivially copyable. It's a template struct. And the, the compiler or the library that's, um, that's vendor specific determines whether this is trivially copyable and then has an internal type in this struct that is either a true type or a false type. Okay, and this, so if it's trivially copyable, so trivially copyable means that you can just copy the, the bits and bytes from one location to another location and you're done. Um, if that is the case, 
then the specialization for your type for is trivially copyable will have an internal type that is the true type. Otherwise, this internal type will be the false type. Okay? Cool. If you have any questions, just raise your arm. Okay? Good. Um, and then in C14, or um, otherwise, if you're still using C11, you can write it yourself. There is um, a template alias that uh, extracts basically this internal type. It says is trivially copyable underscore t equals this internal type. Okay, so that's, it's easier to write or shorter to write this way. And we'll write it this way in, in the following slides um, just for completeness. Okay, so still in pseudocode, um, what we could do now, um, if everything was in runtime, uh, was we could use this trait and say, well, okay, if it's trivially copyable, then uh, we know that, that the value of this thing, because it's, it's either a true type or a false type, is either true or false. So we can branch on that in an if. Okay. So if we wanted to do it in runtime, that would be it. Okay. But since we want to do it at compile time, well, we have to do it slightly different. Okay. And, okay. Uh, for user defined types, there are, there are a bunch of rules, uh, which I don't know from the top of my head. Um, but, I mean, trivially copyable is true for, uh, for the built in types like, like ints and floats and so on. Um, it's, it's true for, for, um, for pod types that are made of these, um, then combinations of, of pod types, and, and th there are a bunch of rules. Like you, you cannot have complex constructors, you cannot have complex copy constructors. I think no, uh, no virtual functions, stuff like that. I'm not sure about the virtual functions, strike that. But um, there, there are many rules for this, and um, you, you'll have to look it up. But and then um, whether the the library. Um, constructs these these types out of uh, more basic types, or whether the library depends on a hook into the compiler, and the compiler ma basically makes this decision that is vendor specific, that is uh, left un undefined. Um, it's just defined that this will work for every type, and it will make the right the right decision. Okay. Cool. So. Um, yeah, as I said, this is for uh, this would be good for runtime. Uh, for compile time, we have to do it slightly different. But now we can make use of the fact that true type and false type are actually different types. So what we can do now is instead of taking the value of this, we can instantiate this this thing. This is trivially copyable underscore t, which is either one type or the other type. So then we would have something like this. So we, we now call one function uh, copy mem or elements. And one of the arguments is this, um, is this freshly constructed thing, which is either a true type or, the, or a false type. And then some other arguments that make sure that we copy the correct range into the new memory, right? And now we have something among the arguments that is either this or that, okay? So we can use this for branching. We can use this in, uh, with function overloading. So we can have one function that takes a true type as the first argument, okay? This would do the mem copy because well, this is for the case that is trivially copyable. And the other case would be the false type. Right? In that case, we, we do copy or move, depending on whether it's no except movable or not. Okay? So the question was whether this is 
preferable to to do it this way or to uh, to use some template parameters with with this type in the end it I think it doesn't really matter um, but I admit I had, I'd had to look into into whatever the compiler generates out of this so but Yeah, yeah. It's it's probably going to be erased from from what the compiler generates. I'm pretty sure, because I mean, there's a high likelihood that this fin this, this function will be inlined anyway, and then uh, whatever you did there is gone. So, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you can god bald it tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. In my experience is one or the other technique. Sometimes you use one and sometimes you use the other. So it's good to know about both. Yeah. Okay. So Klaus says he measured it for at least for his cases. Uh it makes a difference and um it's not preferable to to yeah, tiny difference in any case, but um it's not necessarily preferable to um to have the parameter as a uh, as a function parameter, but maybe you can also use it as a template parameter. In the end, it doesn't really matter. Um, you have function overloads, and um, either you um, use this this type or the instantiation of this um, as a as a parameter for a function, uh, as a call parameter, or you use it as a template parameter. Um, in the end, uh, in most cases, more of a more like a matter of taste. Okay. Okay. Other questions for that? So you're saying this is more expensive in, in terms of compile time, pure compile time. Okay. Well. <laughs> Okay. That's well, so these are the optimization guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really. So yeah, those are the advanced magicians, anyway. <laughs> Wizards. Yes. All right. Cool. Um, but anyway, so this is um, this is a technique called tag dispatch. You you just uh, make this decision in a type and then use this type to dispatch to either one of these um, one of these solutions. And of course, we could uh, continue doing that. We can we could, by the way, also continue doing um, partial specialization if you if we really wanted. Um, so um, there you can always make some. Um, I should also say this. Um, except for the partial specialization for uh, vector bool, what I show here is not exactly what you would see in an implementation in the standard library. If, but if I copied the stuff from the standard library, then uh, there would be so much more stuff and uh, layers of abstraction, of abstraction that um, <coughs> it would be really, really tough to explain that to um, in, a, in a beginner's talk. Okay, so this is tuned down it's less levels of, of extraction that you have in the in the real library but once you get a grip on this um, then you have a chance of actually traversing through the code in the library and have an idea of what's going on okay so again we could uh, use one of the techniques that we already saw um, to do the last branch this um, deciding whether to copy or to move Oops. There is a screensaver that I thought I disabled, but anyway. So <coughs> the next technique was already mentioned by Klaus. It's called uh, Sfina A by many people. Um, they probably forgot what it, many of them don't always remember what it really means. Uh, it stands for substitution failure is not an error, which is a strange name for a technique. Um, doesn't really say what the technique is. 
it just states a rule. It states a rule out of the standard. The rule says, well, substitution failure is not an error. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, in order to explain that, we'll start with something again from type traits. In type traits, there, uh, there are a bunch of nice helpers. Um, this one is called enable if. Now, enable if in its basic form is a template that takes a bool and some, some type uh, defaults to void. And uh, it's called enable if and it's empty. So, well, seems to be pretty worthless. But there is a partial specialization for it, which says, well, if the bool is true, then there will be an embedded type of this type T, of this other parameter that we have. Okay. And then it becomes interesting, uh, even just in the header, uh, in C++14, when you look at what they are doing with this thing. They are specifying a template alias, this enable if underscore t, and it says, all right, that is enable if of whatever you bool you give it, comma, whatever type you give it, and that and would take the embedded type of that. That sounds like a recipe for disaster, right? Because in about half the cases, this is not even valid, right? There is no embedded type T in the, in the general solution. If your bool is false, this will explode. If you ever instantiate this for real, it goes kaboom, right? The, the compiler will, will cry out loud. Right? So this looks dangerous. So what can we do with it? Well, we can use this rule, this substitution failure is not an error. And it goes like this. So we'll have our function called copy or move. And we take that with some iterator and, and some data and say, okay, begin and blah, 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 memory. Okay, and then um, in, the, in the standard case, when we don't find anything special, we just do the copy. Okay. And then there is a, a second overload and says, well, if there is, if we can add another template parameter, this enable if underscore t, with another of these funny type traits, which says, well, this thing is actually no throw move constructible, and take the value of that, then, then we'll do something else. Okay. Now, if you look at this, um, at this enable if thing, well, if your struct or if your if your type is not no except move constructible, then this then this whole expression enable if blah 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 is not going to be valid, okay? But that is called a substitution failure because you have one template parameter t, and then you well you substitute that thing in in this enable if. This is a substitution failure then, because that, is, that doesn't compile, or wouldn't compile, but it's a substitution failure, and that is then not counted as an error. It's a, it's a rule that makes template programming um, well, possible in many cases, um, and well, just says that if this, if this uh, substitution failure occurs, so this uh, enable if thingy for this type is not valid, then, well, this function is just not counted in the overload set. We just ignore it. The compiler just considers it at not, as not being there, right? But it won't explode in your face. Whereas if you call this enable if um, directly outside of this context with this type, then it would not be a substitution failure, and then it would be an error. Okay. So this is, it's a bit of a strange rule at first, but it's, it's very powerful because it means that well, you, can, you can play with this a lot, uh, make, make things or construct things that are only valid in, under certain circumstances, um, wrap that uh, within your template parameters, and cool, the compiler will just remove functions from your overload set, for instance. Okay, 
So with this, we can make the final decision. We have this, um, this, this other type trait, the no-throw move constructible type trait, and then we branch with the help of, uh, of, sub of substitution failure is not an error, which, as I said, the many people just call Sphenae, and they even say, well, this, this function Sphenae is out or something like that. So it's, it's used as a, as a noun, as a verb, as an adjective, anything. Um, just uh, don't get confused by that. It's just making use of this rule that stuff can be invalid um, and still not be counted as an error by the compiler. Yes. Ah. Okay. Good question. Yeah, I forgot forgot to say that. Um, the, the question is. In, in case there is no copy constructor, would we have to um, spin away a, a the, the first version of the function? Um, no, we do not. There are rules for, um, for overloads. So if several overloads apply, sorry. Um, I know no, 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 okay. No, 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 sorry, I was um, sorting my thoughts. Okay, so no, if, um, if several functions if several functions could principally apply, then that is called the, the overload set. So um, the, the parameters match uh, in general. The, the compiler generates a set of candidate functions um, to choose from. Okay? And then there is a set of rules that is, um, that is specified in the standard in, I think, at least two chapters. So it's distributed in the standard and it's on several pages. Is horrible to read, um, but in the end, what it, what it fundamentally says that the more specialized function is going to be the one that is applied, the one that is more more specialized or more constrained, um, that is going to be the one that is applied. In this case, um, if you have two candidates, um, like the the one that uh, that would do the copy and the one that do, would do the move. Um, the, the, the move one is more specialized if that can apply, right? So if you have a move constructor, that will be used, right? And then it doesn't matter if you have uh, a copy constructor or no. So for threads, for instance, um, the, the second one would be more specific because you have more constraints in there and the compiler will choose that one. Okay, so I, I cannot iterate through all the rules, I think, but um, no, I really can't. So if you if you really want to know this, you have to have to read it, I think. Yes. Yes, because of the third template argument is is more constrained. You want to say something, Klaus? Ah, okay. Okay, right. So, yeah, the the Klaus mentioned the it, the question also contained the part whether the the function is fully instantiated. No, it's not. Uh, when template functions are available in the overload set, only the one that is actually chosen will be instantiated. And we'll come to that later. That is uh, that is very important in in many. Situations. That also means ah. that there, there's only one which is left that can be made to be removed, right? So for for this call for for a given type, only one function will be instantiated. Then yes, Andreas. Well, no, the, the the functions, the temp those template functions have to be correct C++, right? They don't have to make sense for the types that you might possibly want to provide to them as long as they are not instantiated. But they have to, but they still have to be valid C++. 
um, again, that there, there are a bunch of rules for that. So yes, the, it has to be valid C++ syntax, and inside of the function, it kind of has to make sense. If you have more than two branches, then you uh, you could combine uh, yes and no traits. So you say um, if it's no throw constructible and not copyable, for instance, and if it's whatever. But I mean, it gets ugly then. So the the attempt is to to make this to make this binary in in most cases, or you use uh, you could use um, type traits that do not have binary logic, so in that case you wouldn't use that. Um, but yeah, if you if you have multiple um, paths that you want to go, um, and you you do not have, maybe that's the answer. If you have multiple uh, paths that you want to go, you you have to be able to to choose unambiguously. So if okay, so the question is if I copy the the second function and uh, use a different type trait, then well if the if the type traits overlap, so let's say you have is no throw move constructible and is move constructible for whatever reason, okay, so they they really overlap, um, then the compiler will for a no throw move constructible type say it's ambiguous it cannot decide whether to use this one or that one no but like i think it even works like even if they if you are 100% sure they cannot collide by making it like artificial it will still not allow you to build that construction yes it will it will if they so if Oh yeah. So okay, okay. So um, no, no. Okay. So um, the right. So this is really annoying. I'm not sure. Um, okay. So if you find a compiler that um, that uses where you can add two functions here, and you have traits that, that do not overlap, and the compiler complains about this being ambiguous, um, I'm pretty sure the compiler is wrong. But with, with different, with, uh, I don't think so, with different, um, okay. Sorry? Okay. Okay, I'll I'll have to try that. Okay, I I don't know. But if yeah, but, but if it's if it's if it's void in both cases, then you, they overlap. Huh? Okay. Well, there's some some homework. Okay, maybe I'll give a lightning talk, <laughs> or you give a lightning talk. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, none of none of this is interview questions. <laughs> Just in case you wonder. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so yeah, some some homework for me and for anyone who wants to give a lightning talk on that. Uh, what happens if you add more overloads to this? Ah, huh, strange. I th I thought this would work, but okay. All right. So yeah, the next slide uh, sums that up. What we just discussed. This is tough, right? It really is, right? And it's so tough that even the the presenter has some problems answering all the questions and gets something wrong. Obviously, sorry for that. Um, so yeah, it's tough, and um, and you should try to avoid 
some of these situations if you can. Um, however, if you haven't started with this kind of stuff yet, and you're about to start, and you can use C++17, then things become different. Because if you remember, we started out with this pseudocode, right? Saying, well, if blah, 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 else, blah, 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 blah. That was easy to read, right? That was, that was nice. What if we could do exactly that, right? And still do everything at compile time? Well, C++17 makes this a reality. Awesome. <laughs> So C++ S17 offers something that is called if const expert. And that means, well, we can just do the checks that we want to do. We just add this const expert keyword to our if and else if. And then only that branch that is selected naturally by these conditions is compiled. And the rest still has to be valid C++. But whether that would compile or not is immaterial. The compiler doesn't care. Right? So with C++17, lots of this, lots of this uh, annoying stuff about tag dispatch or sphene might just go away. Not all of this, but in many cases you can just replace it with if cons expert. The only problem is that many people just cannot use C++17. I, know. I, know. I can't in my job currently. So. <laughs> Damn it. But yes, um, so the, the future is bright. Uh, will be much easier. Cool. So yeah, C++17 rocks. Um, if, you, if you experiment with enable if and this kind of stuff, um, please also look, uh, look at uh, Voyage T. That is out of the scope for this talk, but um, and it would be a bit hard to explain if you don't really appreciate yet what enable if does for you. But once you ex experimented with it a bit, ran into some some edge cases. Uh, Voyage T does does offer a solution for many of these cases, just as a keyword to remember. Cool, good. So now we leave vector and uh, go to, to something different. And that is called CRTP. Again, one of these strange abbreviations. Uh, it stands for Curiously Recurring Template Pattern, which, again, like Sphene, doesn't really explain what it is. Just, well, it's a template pattern. Okay, that's cool, but it's Curiously Recurring. What the hell does that mean? Well, the, the original author and I admit I forgot the name, um, did some analysis of code and found that one pattern is curiously recurring. And so he, he described that in his article, and others picked this term up, and now it's called CRTP. So this pattern just has the name and is more or less by accident from one article. So um, here's a bit of code. Um, and I'll, I'll try to find something that is actually from the standard library, like Vector, um, to explain this, this pattern. So something that hopefully a lot of people know. So let's say we have a struct foo. We have a function that takes a shared pointer to foo. Right? And then um, in the main function, we, we create a shared pointer. And then we'll call this, um, this function do it on foo. And foo. Um, well, wants to call this do something function. Okay, so do something ex expects a shared pointer. And we kind of know that foo happens to be inside of a shared pointer. So what can we do now? How can we, how can we get to this shared pointer and, and pass it on to something? I mean, we're basically it ourselves, right? We as, as foo, right? Louder? Yes, there's a uh, again a tool in the library, some some small thing is called enable shared from this, and we can inherit from it. Okay, so if we say struct foo inherits publicly from enable shared from this, specialized with foo, then uh, we can call a function called shared from this on ourselves. So 
that's inherited from, from uh, this enable shared from this. And that in the case that our object is inside of a shared pointer, it will just deliver this shared pointer. Okay. So this looks strange, right? So we have a struct and in, it inherits from a template and the template parameter for this template happens to be, well, this struct. And some people say, well, that, that looks like recursion. Okay, I heard that before, but um, it isn't. Basically, it's a forward declare, so foo is forward declared, and then we use this forward declaration and put it as a template parameter into, into this template, and then we inherit from it. Okay, so what happens is that in, in this template, enable shared from this, we just know that there is a, um, a type of this, of this name, foo. All the rest is not there yet. Okay, and then, well, let's take a look at the enable shared from this implementation. And this, by the way, um, with minimalistic code cleanup um, to, um, to, um, to deal with several different uh, compiler versions or library versions, this is actually the code from the standard library. So this is almost unabbreviated and, uh, and not simplified like the stuff that I did for Vector. This is the enable shared from this implementation from uh, libc++. So enable shared from this, Again, it, it takes um, some type as a template parameter, and then it, internally it has a, a weak pointer um, of this type. Then there are a bunch of constructors, copy constructor and blah. Okay. Um, then there are these functions that offer this functionality and uh, shared from this, and they return a shared pointer, which is constructed from the weak pointer, Right, and then there is a template friend, and the template friend as well says, "Well, if there is a shared pointer, then that is our friend." Right. So, how does this work now? Right. So, okay, now we we have a base class to our class that happens to have a weak pointer. But if you look at the constructors, the constructors are empty. The copy constructor is empty. Everything is empty, right? Nothing happens ever. Right. So how the hell does this work? Right. First of all, why does it compile? Well, it compiles because um, for, the, for the weak pointer, you just need to know that there is a type. You don't need the, the type definition. And as I said, we're just passing basically the name of the type. So but for a weak pointer, you don't have to do, have that. And for the, uh, um, also for the rest, you don't need to know the, 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 the type for this um, to compile, first of all. But then um, at some point in time, well, this weak pointer probably has to be filled because otherwise this won't work. And what happens is, well, this, this friend shared pointer thingy, that's the, that's the key. And the shared pointer implementation knows about enable shared from this. And it knows that, well, if the type with, with, with which you specialize it, if that is derived from enable shared from this, then it will instantiate this weak pointer. So the shared pointer is actually doing the work here. Okay. And this, this pattern of inheriting from a template and passing the, the type that inherits to the template, that is called CRTP. And it looks really strange, and um, there, I'm giving one, one more example uh, for this. It looks really strange at first, um, because, well, you, you have two sides of this thing, and one is the, the derived thing, which is not there yet when you, uh, when you look at the base thing, but the base thing kind of depends on the derived thing. It's, it's, really, it's really strange, but it's, it's very powerful to, to do stuff like this, for instance. Okay, questions about this construct? I, um, also, uh, another question um, that is a... Uh, 
question actually for, for my benefit. This is the only example that I could think of where CRTP is openly used in the standard library. Does anybody know of other examples? Just curious. It doesn't have to be here or I, I'd be happy about emails or anything afterwards here. I'd be interested to, to know about other cases. This is the only thing that I could think of. All right. Hmm? In the standard library. So personally, I, I use it in, in several places, so I, I have no shortage of use cases for this. <laughs> um, but uh, within the standard library, I'm not aware of any other location where it's actually being used. Okay. Okay. So Paul says maybe maybe iterators of. Okay. Possible. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another topic for a lightning talk. I knew it. <laughs> cool. Um, right. So another thing for uh, CRTP and uh, or in the context of CRTP and something that is uh, good to know for um, template programming is something that is called deferred instantiation. Uh, we already talked a bit about that as, as a side note to other topics. And that is, well, let's say we have this, this base class and we're still in the CRTP context. So the base class um, is, is used with some, some T and it's a function um, and the function does something with a function from the base class. Now, since we are in a CRTP context and we, we know that this base class is derived by something and the something is going to be the template argument for the base class, we know that if we have an instance of the base class, it can also be um, statically cast to, well, no, sorry, the a reference or a pointer to that could be cast to a reference or pointer to the, um, to the derived class. Okay, so just since we know the, the structure of, of, the, uh, of the hierarchy here. Okay, and then um, it is syntactically correct to say that, well, in that case, um, well, we can, we can cast this and we can call some function on this. Okay, so as long as it's not instantiated, this function, then it's cool. And this happens to be um, the case. It's, it is not um, it is not instantiated here, and it's also not instantiated when we um, when we construct um, the derived class, right? Um, the the function declaration is there that has to be um, that has to be compilable now, but the the body is not not compiled yet. It's not instantiated yet. Sorry, it's comp probably the wrong word. Um, so it's not instantiated yet. Um, only if you actually call foo on some object, then this function will be instantiated. But then, by then, by that time, um, derived is already fully defined. So the compiler knows everything, which means that, well, this, this whole thing is defined, okay? Um, so again, looks very strange, the CRTP stuff, right? But um, due to the fact that function bodies are only instantiated, when they are actually called, um, this works again. And we can take this one level further, um, and now it gets really ugly. So let's say um, we have a function foo in the base class, and the, the return type of this function somehow de depends on the base class, uh, so, oh, sorry, on the, on the derived class, okay? So let's say we want to do that, right, because foo impl could either return a string or an int or I don't know what. Um, and it's not always the same. So let's say we have this. Now, this actually doesn't compile. Okay? Because the function declaration, in including the return type, that has to be available once we instantiate this uh, this template, the, uh, the, the, the base template. And uh, when we instantiated it, when we instantiated it um, that is when we um, start to construct derived, 
Okay, so the compiler basically reads derived colon public base of derived. Okay, so it knows there is a struct called derived. Um, it inherits from from the base thingy. It doesn't know anything about derived yet. Instantiates base with it and sees, oh, we're looking for an internal type of of derived. I don't have that. It's not there yet. Okay, so it will it will fail to compile. This the compiler will bail out here. Um, but there is a trick here that we can use to force the compiler to defer the instantiation of this. And that is, well, we just add one more line. We say, okay, we'll make this a, a template, this, this foo, which before was just a function inside of a template. So, well, it's instantiated only when, it's com when you actually use it. Um, but if we make it a template function within the template, um, with some default parameter that we never will use, right? So it's just there um, to make the compiler happy. Then this this function could be anything, right? And or this uh, and this x could be anything. We just say, well, in most cases it will be t, but you never know. And the compiler says, well, in that case, if I never know, then okay, I'm happy with that, and only looks really at foo if you try to instantiate with something. And if you don't specify what the parameter is, then it says, okay, that's t, um, and t happens to be derived, but by that time, you already have to find what derived is, so you can call it, you, the return type is defined, everything is cool. But there is, um, I guess you meant foo impl, right? Oh, I, mean, I meant, yeah, yeah, sure, sorry, I meant foo impl there. <laughs> yeah, consistency is awesome, isn't it? <laughs> yes, um, yes. The the function in in the derived class should be full impl. Thank you. Okay, that's tough. I know. So, question. Yes, so uh, users could abuse the fact that foo now is a template, yes. Um, so, okay, the, so first of all, um, yes, you can, you can probably try to, um, to use Sphena A to um, disallow uh, the, the abuse of this function. Yes, you could. Um, the other comment slash question was whether or not we could use concepts once they are in the language. Um, I'm not familiar with the latest draft of, uh, of concepts. There was a, um, the, the first few versions um, actually required the return type to be valid, uh, even if the concept is invalid, which was a major bummer. So I, I assume, and I had discussions with Andrew Sutton about this, and he, he promised to take a look at this. So I assume that by now, in the current uh, technical specification for concepts, um, this would be gone. So if you have um, a template that requires some constraints, uh, and the constraints are not fulfilled, um, then the compiler won't look at the return type, so this problem will probably be gone with concepts, but I would have to look into the uh, specification. I don't know whether that's the case. Um, yeah. Come again?
Oh, so um, yeah, C plus plus fourteen has auto return type deduction. Um, that is a bitch sometimes. It really is um, because um, for the compiler to to know what the complete function signature is of a function, it has to instantiate the whole function. And it does that for the overload set. So if your code does not compile under certain circumstances, so in this case, it won't matter, right? In this case, that will be fine, I think. I'm pretty sure. Um, but in, in other cases, so if you, um, if you um, have cases that may or may not compile with, with your template arguments, um, auto return type deduction can really bite you. Because the compiler for the um, for the for generating the overload set has to know the complete specification uh, declaration of the function, which includes the return type. And the return type is only known once the compiler instantiate the whole body of the function. If that doesn't compile, then then you're dead. And that is that is not that is not sfinae then. So if the body doesn't compile, that does not count as sfinae. You can use decal type to do that. Um, good question. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. There's so going. There's going to be so many template lightning talks. <laughs> Funny. Um, yeah, decal type uh, probably works. Yes. Yes, I'm pretty sure that decal type would work here as well. Yeah. Okay, so the, the question is, um, can we use, just use static assert to um, enforce that, um, that X and T are the same? Um, yes, you can. Um, static asserts has, some, has pros and cons. Um, it can give you a, a nice error message, and if you say that, well, this is definitely wrong, and whatever your intention was, this is wrong, never do that, then you can use static assert. If you say that, well, maybe, or it, my, my user should be able to test this at, at compile time, whether this is a valid expression, and if not, then do something else, uh, then static assert is not a good thing, because static assert is a hard error. It's, again, not something that you can use in a Sphena context, so uh, you, you need to choose your weapons wisely. Okay, but in this case, in this case, it's fine. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Type trace for the for the win. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but you have a template. Can't you just in any case always just specialize it for T and inject your own code? Because you can't really use that. So um what do you mean specialize? I can specialize this for like I fully specialize the template. Uh, And yeah, so partial specialization for functions is is not available. Um, and I don't think that you could have an out of class implementation just for the case that x equals t. I don't think that's possible. And and if you and if you did that, then you would still the compiler would still have to deal with the case that. If you use uh, int instead of whatever you expected, um, then it would have to deal with the fact that there, that there is no implementation for that. So even if that worked, then you would still get a, a very strange compiler error. OK? Cool. Good. So uh, now that we've covered the basics, um, just because all my talks something about SQL++11. Let's take a short look at uh, how it's used there. Um, so 
SQL++ 11 allows you to, um, as I said in the beginning, allows you to uh, write SQL queries in C++. It looks almost like SQL. So you have a select um, two columns from a, uh, from a table foo where some condition is true. Okay, and then do with the result whatever you want. Um, the, the interesting thing about this expression here is um, where do these functions come from? The, the from and the where, where does this come from? And um, actually, this is using CRTP. So CRTP is used to, um, to pull functions from, from some base classes into a statement. Okay, and the statement looks like this. So you have a, a statement template with a, um, a bunch of clauses as template parameters. And the, um, and the clauses then contain, um, contain templates again. And these templates are used as base classes. And the, um, the template argument for these base classes happens to be the template with all its arguments. So that's why it looks a bit even stranger than what we had before. Okay, so a statement is a very big template, so it takes any number of, um, of clauses. Okay, then it inherits from an embedded template within these uh, template parameters, from all of them, right? For, from every single clause, it inherits. So it's multiple inheritance, or it, uh, you could call it variadic inheritance, um, and it's variadic CRTP. That's an accepted term by now. Um, so it's very like CRTP, and the, the base classes or the, the base templates happen to be embedded templates within the template arguments of statement. And the, the template parameter for these base class or for these base templates is the statement itself with all its clauses. That's why you have um, two times the uh, dot, dot, dot in this. The inner one is. Uh, saying that, hey, this is our, uh, the, the, the statement that we're talking about with all its clauses that is used as a te template argument. And this whole thing happens for each and every clause. Okay? And then you have base classes that represent um, the, the, the select itself. You have base classes that, select, uh, that represent the from, base classes for the where, and so on. Okay? And uh, if you look then at, uh, at the from clause, then it uh, looks like this. So you have this base template. It, it takes as a parameter the statement. And then uh, the, the from method, which is um, what we are pulling into our statement through this inheritance, um, that uses uh, deferred instantiation in the return type. So this, this whole thingy with a uh, new statement type uh, with some check type in there. The check is something similar to the type trace that we've, that we've seen before. Um, so that instantiates something that is always sane, regardless of whether this check is valid and uh, or the argument for, for the from is actually a table or, or a join. Um, and otherwise it will yield something different, but it will still yield a type that is, that is valid. So we have deferred instantiation in, in the blue stuff, and uh, we have tag dispatch in the red stuff. So this um, check type um, is, is, a, is a type that is, um, well, internal to the from clause. This one checks whether uh, the argument is a table. So it's a, it's the, the same idea as with the type trace from the standard library. It's just a specific one for this <laughs> library. Okay, and then we'll do tag dispatch, and we do tag dispatch to two implementations. Uh, one is um, the, the lower one is for the consistent type where, um, where this is actually valid. Um, then my types are, um, uh, are not just binary, it's not just a false and a true type, but it's one that is uh, that says okay everything is fine I could use the the true type there um, and will probably in the future and the the other one is just a um, a type that represents the the result of this check and describes 
why this table or why this argument is actually not a table and what else it could be. And this then includes um, information for the compiler to do error messages and then can be used. Okay, so we'll not cover that in, in detail. But the, the principal idea is again this, the same thing as what we did before. So a attack dispatch based on a check, exactly the same as with the type traits. Um, and, and then, well, we go either way. Okay, and in the good case, we create an, a new statement, which now has the information from, from the from call, uh, drops the from function, so you cannot fr call from again, again through uh, CRGP, the, the new thing inherits from something that doesn't contain the from functions, you cannot make mistakes there. Okay, so this is one example of how you can use uh, some of the techniques that I've shown today, right? Okay, so is it template magic? No, it's not. Um, <laughs> some people are nodding <laughs> for this question. And <laughs> okay, um, so no, it's no, it's no magic. Um, it's just techniques that take some time to understand. That takes some some practice. Um, so I, I'd say it's template perseverance or something like that. So you, you have to, you have to deal with it, right? So, um, and we look today at partial specialization. Uh, that's for vector boom. We looked at type trace. That was for deciding at compile time if certain things are true or not true. Uh, we looked at tag dispatch as one way of branching. Uh, we looked at Sphene as another way of branching. We looked at CRTP. Um, as a way of um, getting stuff into into your type or doing stuff like the um, enable shared from this. We used um, deferred instantiation as a technique to trick the compiler into accepting code that otherwise wouldn't be available just by making it not instantiate something in the beginning. And yes, that's that's it for today. Use it, play with it, Give lightning talks, right? It becomes easier over time. I promise that. So if you if you keep practicing that, um, that's easier over time, um, and it becomes easier with every standard. So if if const expert uh, will help, const um, the the um, concepts will help. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe you heard about these uh, this thing called meta classes. Um, that would be awesome. That will instra. Uh, and insert all kinds of new things into the language, which will make things much easier in many cases. Um, so, um, even if you don't want to do it today, um, if you want to, if you want to build something in a year from now or so, um, be be aware it will become easier. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, Daniel. <laughs> you want to talk about it? Um, okay, yeah, so the comment was that uh, what we discussed before, the um, using decal type in, in the case where we have to defer the instantiation uh, might or will not work if what we decal type on is, is something that has to be there in that moment. That is probably correct. That is, it's not a dependent type, yes. Um, so you would have to um, decal type on something that is also templated. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you can do something with with decal type, but yes, you will have to pay attention that um, that what you use in decal type is actually 
um, something that has that cannot be instantiated by the compiler at that moment. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so there are a bunch of techniques. Um, I actually gave talks about that at CPPCon and meeting C++. The, the principal idea is to, to move the checks that you have to make um, as close to the, your API boundary as possible. That's the, the overall idea. As soon as you have a check that fails, um, 10 levels of templates inside of your code, the error messages will always be horrible. And you will probably be the only person to, to understand if that, right? Um, but if you, if you manage to move the conditions and the respective checks to the API boundaries, as you would do with any runtime code, then you can constrain the error messages to a minimum. And then you, the, the, um, the other part to that is, um, so you have a check um, that is at the API boundary as close as possible. And if the check goes right, then you go into your, the code that you want to execute. And if it goes wrong, then you go into some branch that either contains a, a static assert or does something to make the compiler stop and not um, iterate into your code. So you have to branch there, right, on this condition. That means, in other words, fail early. Fail early, yes. Yeah. But it's, it's the same idea as with runtime code. You, you, get, you get input from the outside world. So somebody calls your function, uh, if you do not, uh, if you do not check the, the parameters at that point and and branch on this decision, um, then well, you will have some exceptions later, and uh, people won't know why why it happened now and not earlier. And it's the same thing with templates. It's just a bit harder uh, and and um, let's say uh, not you're not used to to do that. Um, typically when you're dealing with templates as much as you would do with runtime code. Um, but it, it, it's, um, it's a question of, of um, discipline and of experience um, if you want to do that. Right. Most people in the beginning, if they, when they start with this kind of stuff, they're happy if the golden path goes right. right? Because it's, it is tough. Right? This kind of stuff is hard to do, and if you have no experience or little experience, then this kind of coding is really, really, um, is really, really tough, and to make it work at all is tough. Okay? But once you are beyond this level and, and say, okay, I know what I'm doing, and I, I can write this code, uh, and I have some confidence in it, um, then, latest, you should start thinking about um, checking for errors wrong parameters as early as possible and as close to the API boundary as possible. And then branch. Yes. Yeah, th th there <sighs> Yeah, there, there are techniques to, to move the results of these checks back to where you came from, similar to, um, to exceptions that traverse through the code and you just catch them at the API boundary and give a, a reasonable error message. There are techniques for that. Um, it won't, I, I can't cover that now. I, I refer you to the talk that I gave.
Okay. <laughs> Lucas wants to mention concepts again. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. First of all, concepts are not available yet. Um, sorry? In GCC, they are available, but they are horribly buggy still. Um, so as soon as you want to do something that is a little bit more complex, um, it, the, the compiler will crash. It won't just give you error messages. messages. The compiler will crash. Uh, you can always almost depend on that. Um, and well, concepts are not there yet in in the standard. They are so most probably not there yet for any kind of production code that you want to use. Um, concepts offer the promise that um, they will reduce compiler error messages, but it, but they have the, the same problem. If you check your concepts deep within your hierarchy, you will still get horrible error messages. So concepts have to be used wisely in, in order to, um, to bring real effect there. They're voted in as a, te as a technical specification. That's not part of, anyway. That's a technicality. Okay, Daniel, you had some, some more comments? Yeah, in general, I think it's a good idea to use something too complex to get a function. But write meta function with text and then on the top of that, write new meta functions. So, um, and they're easy to test for your static at first. And once you have something and you know it, it's working for all the branches, uh, then you can go on and do a more complex meta function based on that. But then, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, testable writing, uh, so yeah, writing simple meta functions um, is, was one comment. Um, that is always a good idea. Do not try to put too much stuff into one, one of these constructs that you build there. That's one of the reasons why I, why I use binary decisions in, in all these examples. I uh, broke everything down into binary stuff much easier this way um, and anyway what you're, what you're, when, you're, when you're trying to do something try to break it down into smaller things and then combine them and you can as you said you can test these smaller things um, you can try to make them uh, work with everything um, if that is an option and otherwise yeah you can use all kinds of techniques like static assert or whatever um, but again if all of that doesn't really matter if you have um, something that fails or makes the compiler fail somewhere deep in the template hierarchy, you always, uh, you're always confronted with horrible error messages. So you really have to try to move that, that error message to the API boundary. That's, uh, that is the, the most important thing about this if you want to reduce error messages. Right. And there are, there are ways to do that. Um, even if you have checks that are deep inside, then you can still traverse uh, back and, and basically report this back to the API boundary and, and do something about it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so th there, um, there are strong voices in the uh, C++ community that totally disagree with what you just said. Um, that um, the, the user of your library should not need to learn to interpret all these uh, horrible error messages because, um, for instance, uh, Eric Niebler says that, and I personally agree completely, if you have these kinds of horrible error messages, um, then your library is faulty. And it's, if you in, encounter horrible error messages, then it's worth a bug report. And it's not just a convenience thing, it's a bug. Right? Not everybody agrees with this. 
simply because it's so hard to get it right at all. But um, if you're at a certain level and you um, you want to have a wider user base, um, your code should produce short error messages no matter what. There are limits to that. And you, in many cases, you cannot limit it to below three lines or something like that, or maybe five lines. But if you, if your library makes the compiler spoo a hundred lines, consider it a bug. Yes. If you're the li if you're the library author, then you have to deal with it, and in many cases you will uh, encounter stuff that is much much worse than any user will hopefully ever see because your library itself is buggy and the the code doesn't even work and even in the good cases um, it does something wrong and something is instantiated in a way that you didn't expect and then all hell breaks loose and then whoa yeah the problem won't start with, uh, as an author the library needs to start as a user that can library and then if you can yes all right Um, the question is if there is a debugger for um, templates. Um, well, first of all, you can, um, if you know where it explodes or shortly before that, you can, you can trick the compiler into giving you all kinds of information by, for instance, saying, um, you, you, let's say you have some some uh, some object, and you would like to know what type it exactly is because well you you ten levels inside of your template hierarchy you just don't know um, well just say object dot your name for instance okay um, this will never compile but the compiler will exactly tell you that um, this object dot name does not exist and it will give you the type information. You can do the same with types. Um, you can do the same with, with templates and stuff like that. There is also um, um, there is a tool called I, I forgot there 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 is some something like um, like a template explorer. Um, I have to look up the name. I I forgot the name for that. Just try to remember the the name of the author of that. I think it's the same author as uh, the one for MetaPass. So if you look up MetaPass, you have the author, then you probably get the the library for that or the the tool for that. Hmm? David Senkel. Yes, exactly. No. Sorry, no, not David Senkel. Hmm? Yeah, Bulgarian guy. Um, nice person. I, the, the name is on the tip of my tongue, but well, we'll come back later. But if you look from, from um, I've, I'm pretty sure it's the same author as the author for MetaPass, um, which is a, an awesome compile time library that lets you analyze uh, strings at compile time and do all kinds of crazy stuff with that. Um, and he has written a tool that lets you explore templates um, I haven't really used that. I'm relying more on this brutal technique of uh, just letting the compiler tell me what the hell this is. Um, but it's a it's a matter of taste and and uh, experience and whatever. So I, I just wanted to add. There is a. I mean, probably nowadays there's better tools than that like this. But what I used to do in Microsoft compiler is specifically with. with um, Actually, instantiate forces to compile to instantiate all the templates, but actually not try to, to build them, uh, to, to compile the code, to generate the code. It just generates the type name, and it was intended. It is actually intended to search for mm, multiple symbols to look for errors. But you do well, else, and you want to see whether I have a conflict with symbols. And you can. I, I forgot what the what the name of the site is. It's actually not that well documented, but. It's it, it bits of code which where you see the what the compiler is actually going to instantiate. So it just inserts the depth types into the into the type parameters 
So you could see, okay, that can never work. And that is a specific, specific flag, a specific specific flag. I used to, I have to use that as I was looking for that type of virus, but it's the wrong flag. So probably now it's just like that. Hmm? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Okay. So to to summarize that for for the video, uh, so Paul says there at least there was a flag in the Microsoft compiler to instantiate all the templates, uh, not really do anything with it, um, but instantiate everything so that you could at least look up all the types that you would um, that would that you would compile and then um, see that a bunch of stuff probably won't work. Okay. Cool. Then I'll say thanks again and have a, a lot of thoughts about lightning talks and hopefully see you to see you in uh, two weeks. <laughs>